Okay, so, um, so again, I've written down on the blackboards the, the Riemann hypothesis and the basic examples that uh, I've used. And uh, so today I want to begin by saying a bit more about the conductor of trace functions or of the associated representations. So and give in some sense what's the precise definition without uh, going too much into the details and explain why we need something a bit more than the two informations we already know. So suppose you have a trace function k mod p. So you don't need to assume that it's geometrically reducible or anything like that. So it's associated to a representation rho. So some elliptic representation or whatever. And uh, so the complexity is really an invariant of the representation for the trace function itself. You would just take the infimum over all uh, possible rho with trace function k. So we already know two components of this. So we want to measure the complexity. And we saw that, I mean, I said that we take first the, the dimension of v at least. Uh, then there is this singular set. So it's a subset of p1 of fp bar. which is a finite subset, which is an invariant of rho, and you have to take these two. And this is not enough. So what I'm going to do is going to tell you what is the definition and then give an example to show that these two components, which are easy to understand uh, and which uh, are the obvious invariants, are not sufficient to get good uh, properties of the conductor. So you need something else, which is uh, the way we define it. It's a sum of contributions corresponding to every singular point of an invariant called the Swann conductor at x of the representation. So where uh, Swann x of rho is an integer non-negative. Uh, so measuring what's called wild ramification at a singular point. Uh, so it is sometimes zero. Then one speaks of tame ramification. But uh, not always. So I'm going to give an example that shows that uh, if you want to have a statement like the Riemann hypothesis, so if you want a statement like this to be true with uh, an invariant, a complexity invariant, it would not suffice to define just the dimension of V plus the set, the number of singular points. This would not be enough. And then I'll give a few examples, but not much more. Uh, so this is an invariant that's uh, quite subtle and delicate. Uh, and in many applications, if you don't know the conductor and you need to estimate the conductor, this will be the, the art part to control because it's really a subtle algebraic invariant of the representation, which is not so accessible from purely diophantine or concrete properties of the trace function. So why do we need this? Okay, so there are two reasons. So the first one is uh, if we want uh, the complexity to be some kind of height, uh, so that, so what do we want? What does it mean to be a kind of height? That means we want uh, the sets of rho such that uh, the complexity of rho is less than x and let's say rho is geometrically reducible, modulo geometric isomorphism uh, is finite for every x. 
So this is the more precise form of what I described at, in the first lecture. I mean, I said this height has, I mean, this complexity has a height property. At that time, I had not said what it means to be geometrically reducible. So this is the right thing to do. These are the building blocks of all uh, trace functions or all representations. And uh, you have to take modular geometric isomorphism because otherwise multiplying by a scalar with absolute value one gives you infinitely many which are geometrically isomorphic to a given one. But if you do it this way, then actually it's a finite set. So this would not be true if you just take the dimension of V plus the size uh, of the singular set. Then we have uh, So if you set, take the set of all rho where, so rho is geometrically reducible, but uh, the dimension of V plus the set, set of singular points is less than x, so modulo isomorphism, geometric isomorphism as above, then this is not finite. And that's simply because it contains all uh, kind of over all rho associated to trace functions of the type EP of f of x, where f is a polynomial of arbitrary degree. Okay, so when one does this type of correspondence, it's possible to do it in such a way that it's essentially uh, injective from uh, fp of x to the set of representations. So I won't go into details. And here the point is that the dimension of v for all of these will always be one, independently of f. And the singular point will always be restricted to infinity independently of f. So this object, a polynomial is only really strangely behaved at infinity. Then when we take the exponential, uh, every value which is not infinity behaves the same. So intuitively it's somewhat clear that this is the only point that could be singular, and in fact it is. Um, at least if f is non-constant. So this last part would be for degree of f at least. Okay, and so we have infinitely many polynomials because the degree is unbounded, and all of them have the same dimension and same singular set. Uh, so this set is infinite, but we want the height property to be true. So we need something else that, in this case, has to take into account the degree of f. So what's missing in this case is very clear. If we bound the degree of f, then we have a finite set, growing with p, p to the power d, but nevertheless finite. So here, so we miss here a bound on the degree of f, and it is a fact. So once the Swan conductor is defined rigorously and so on, uh, we have that the Swan conductor at infinity of such a rho, let me maybe call it rho f, so that associated to this, will be the degree of f, at least if the degree is prime to p. And in any case, it's always at most the degree of f. So the Swan conductor of an additive character of a function will always be at most the order of the pole of the function at the singular point. So in this case, the pole is at infinity, so it's a degree. And there's equality if they are co-prime with the characteristic. So, and the second example is uh, in some sense similar in the, that the issue will also be of the same type that there's additive characters of polynomials with unbounded degree. Uh, but it's more concrete in the sense that you might say that, okay, this height-like property is nice, but it's not the essence of what we want to do in analytic number theory. So this is much more important. However, this would fail with a conductor defined just as the sum of the dimension and S rho, essentially for the same type of reasons. So consider an integer k at least one, such that p is congruent to one mod k. Or consider k and then look at all the primes congruent to one mod k and define k of x to be ep of x to the power k. So then if you look at the sum s 
Kp, which is the just the Gaussian built with this Ep of xk. So it's a generalization of quadratic Gaussians. X in Fp. So it's a generalization of the fact that the quadratic Gaussian is the same as the quadratic Gaussian for the real character. That this, uh, under this condition, you detect the fact of being a case power using uh, characters of the quotient group Fp star modulo Fp star to the power k. There are uh, k such characters. One of them will give a trivial contribution, and the other ones will give k minus 1 Gaussian. So this is, in this condition, the sum of k minus 1 Gaussian. So by Gaussian, I mean things like Ep of x, chi of x, where chi will be of order uh, k, and non-trivial. Okay, and under this condition, of course, we know there are such characters. There are k of them and k minus 1 non-trivial. Uh, so it's not easy, not hard to find, to deduce that uh, if you take, so if you try and do the inner product with the constant function 1, so as p goes to infinity, p can go to 1 mod k, then this will be k minus 1. Uh, normalized by scope of p. Okay, on the other end, uh, the associated dimension of, which I call vk, plus the set of singular points is again uh, 1 plus 1. For the same reason as before, it's an example of the previous construction with f a power. So dimension is 1 and there's just one singularity at 1. Uh, so you see that an estimate like the first part of the Riemann hypothesis does not hold with uh, C1 and C2 replaced by just the dimension plus the number of singular points. So Rh uh, would fail with uh, C of k i replaced by dimension plus number of points. Okay, so it's clear that this is geometrically non-trivial. Uh, this is not constant uh, as x varies. Well, maybe it's constant with p is equal to 2. I don't know. Not even that, I think. No, because it's 1 at... Yeah, it's e of 1 over p for x equals 1, and it's 1 at x equals 0. So this is not proportional to a constant. So it is geometrically non-constant geometrically not isomorphic to the trace function 1, so we can apply the first part of Riemann hypothesis, uh, and this would not tr be true without this assumption. Yeah? So in both of these cases, the dimension of E is 1 in your example, so suppose that we restrict this set to dimension of E greater? That doesn't work either. So it, it would fail, for instance, with hyperclustomal sums when R goes to infinity. But these are the simplest examples. <laughs> So I don't want to go into more details about this because in some sense this is the trickiest part and analytically it's the one that's the most painful. Uh, so one tries to avoid it as much as possible. Uh, again, if you're working with well-known trace functions, meaning those you would find in a table or in a list of examples, then that means that these tables are only good if they include information on the Swan conductor. Um, so this is known. So let's go back to the examples. So here, uh, for additive characters, as I said, uh, if f is a polynomial, let's say, well, so if x is a pole of f, then the Swan conductor at x is at most the order of the pole, with equality if it's co-prime to p. So that's generalization of what I did. So we see here the feature that the Swan conductor is local in, in some sense. Uh, here it only depends on the order of the pole of f at this point. Uh, it's, it's local in a more precise technical sense that is sometimes useful. So here, uh, the singularities are zeros and pole of f, but all the Swan conductors are zero. So multiplicative characters in this sense are easier to handle in some cases because they are tamely ramified everywhere. So all the Swan conductors are zero. 
uh, hyperclustermann sums, so singular set was zero and infinity. It's tamely ramified at zero. So Swan conductor at zero is zero. And at infinity, it's one. Okay. Uh, here, let's say that P does not divide the degree of F. Then the Swan conductor at every singular point will be zero. So uh, point counting functions are also tamely modified. And for the Legendre family, this is also um, Swan at zero equals Swan at one equals Swan at infinity is also zero, at least if P is at least five. And this actually is related, so if you know a bit of the analytic series of elliptic curves, the exponent of the conductor of an elliptic curve defined over Q is always bounded by two, at most two, except for uh, prime p equals two, two or three, and this is the same type of behavior. So the fact that the conductor is exponent bounded by two is a, also a feature of time ramification, uh, and in the case of trace functions, this uh, goes into this type of properties. So this is going to be typically true for any family of uh, algebraic varieties. If the equations are defined over z and fixed, and p goes to infinity, uh, for p large enough, then everything would be tamed. If you just count the number of solutions. Okay. So this is all I want to say about the conductor, at least for today. Maybe tomorrow I will have a little bit more in, a, in one of the applications I want to discuss. So what I'm going to do now in the remainder of today and tomorrow is give some kind of uh, survey of some of the applications, trying to highlight some of the features, how one uses the Riemann hypothesis, and how it meshes up with analytic number theory. So some applications. So first part. Um, so in the first part, I will uh, discuss the results in uh, some uh, series of papers with uh, Fouvry and uh, Michel. which is where we started working with these objects, where uh, we are trying to understand their correlations with automorphic data. So the uh, motivating problem, or one motivating problem, it's not quite exactly where things completely started, but it's uh, something that I'm going to take as motivation, is to understand, so given a modular form, F uh, on a congruent subgroup, let's say gamma zero n. So this is uh, classical modular forms, subgroup of SL to Z. But it could be a mass form or holomorphic. So we have applications in all cases. Or it could in fact be Eisenstein or cuspidal. Again, there are applications of both cases, and I mentioned some of them, uh, with, so it's not so important for us whether it's Fourier coefficients or Aker eigenvalues, but let's assume that it's uh, Aker eigenform with Aker eigenvalues lambda f of n, n at least one. So normalize so that the mean square is about uh, one, so lambda f of n squared is equivalent to a constant depending on f times x. So the usual analytic normalization. So we consider, so uh, fix a prime p, which will then tend to infinity, and the trace function k mod p. we consider sums like S, F, K, P, which is smooth sums obtained by comparing lambda f of n, so an automorphic uh, isometric function, Fourier coefficients, against this choice function, which we view as a function defined of all the integers by periodicity. 
and the critical length is about p, which is natural because k is periodic modulo p. So we take a smooth cutoff at n over p. So this is a sum which you can think of as being between 1 and p, but with a smooth cutoff. And the estimates will be such that the sum could be a little bit shorter, uh, p to the 1 minus some small constant. Um, when n gets extremely large, so if the length was, let's say, p cubed or p4 or something, then you would just use periodicity and uh, replace this as a sum over a of k of a times the sum over integers congruent to a and apply known results on Fourier coefficients in arithmetic progressions to handle this type of thing. So where p is a smooth cutoff, which in fact can oscillate a little bit, but the First idea to have in mind is the usual picture, which I think Enrique Vanietz has drawn on his blackboard every single time I've spoken with him, and which is the right way of doing these things to avoid uh, analytic issues until you really need that to handle them, if you need to handle them. So, so we start with that, and we want to obtain estimate. So the philosophy is the usual one that unless these objects are collected in a strong sense, there should be some cancellation in the sum. So lambda f of n is roughly bounded on average, at least in mean square. k of n we know is actually bounded by the conductor. So if the length is about p, you can expect in good cases to get scout of p uh, cancellation. And uh, we try to get some cancellation at least, which would show that automorphic data cannot be modeled uh, in an easy way with this kind of trace functions. So the goal is cancellation. So this can be seen as a challenge. On, so we think we know something about automorphic forms. We think we know something about trace functions. Can we actually show that we know something about them? Or it has applications. So I'll start uh, by discussing this kind of as a challenge, and then we'll see the applications. So a basic example that you can have in mind, or two examples. So actually the first one will immediately show that it's not a purely academic game. So a simple example is a multiplicative character. So k of n is k of n, where k is mod p and non-trivial, let's say. So Dirichlet character. Then because the length is p, detecting cancellation in that case, lambda f of n, k of n, is more or less the same. So that's the right length because of the uh, conductor of the twist is p squared times n, maybe, if p is co prime to n. So uh, the sum in that case, sf chi p, uh, controls subconvexity for the twisted L function at 1 f. Uh, in level aspect. With respect to, meaning that if we get power cancellation, then we will get some kind of subconvex estimate for these L functions, which are very important in analytic number theory and in applications. So, kind of one of the guiding examples we had. So at first we had no idea what would come out. Um, So I don't mention the example of additive characters. The example of additive characters is one that's very well known uh, due to, there's an estimate of Wilton, which is easy. Uh, but the first example we kind of used as trying to see whether we could do it. So our challenge was to try and do it with EP of n bar, so EP of 1 over n modulo p, uh, which, or, which is kind of a building block of clue sum and sums. Uh, can we show that the sign changes of the inverse modulo p are sufficiently random are sufficiently independent of, let's say, uh, the coefficients of the delta function of Ramanujan. This, this type of basic question, which is not easy even for this very special case. So it was uh, one challenging example. Okay, and then Okay, so maybe I'll just, in fact, give another example immediately. So this is where we vary the k, but uh, there's also, quickly, there are special cases of automorphic forms 
where you take uh, for f an Eisenstein series. So let's take the Eisenstein series at one half plus i t, where t is a real number. Then uh, lambda f of n is the sum of a over b to the power i t, where a b is equal to n. So strictly speaking, for t is equal to 0, we have to take the derivative, because this is literally 0, but <coughs> I'm ignoring this. So for t equals 0, the Fourier coefficients are the divisor function. And therefore, you get uh, the type of sum that we're looking at for e 1 half plus i t, uh, k and p is a sum over integers mn um, at least 1 of k of mn, v of mn over p. So this would be for t equals 0. And in general, you have m over n to the power i t. OK, and these are very interesting because they, are, they give you special bilinear forms when you're trying to apply uh, combinatorial identities to detect primes. And the, the presence of the i t and the fact that we're going to get uniform estimates with respect to t to some extent allows you to balance the size of m and n in certain intervals. So you get uh, special bilinear forms, but in great generality, when the coefficient is k of mn, where k is a trace function. So this will be the application later. OK, so now I'll state the results and then say a few words on the proof. And uh, in particular, I liking what, what is used about trace functions in this proof. So it will depend on the Riemann hypothesis, but it's interesting to see analytically how it's used, how it comes up. So there exists a positive absolute constant. I think we checked it can be taken to be 9, but I'm not sure, so, such that uh, for every prime p, for every k mod p, let's say geometrically reducible, so this is not, strictly speaking, necessary, but um, with, so in the, in the Eisenstein case, so suppose t equals 0, you take the Eisenstein case, you have sum of d of n times k of n, n less than p, essentially. So if then k is a constant, you're not going to get cancellation. Sum of d of n has no cancellation. And if k is an additive character, it also doesn't quite work. So uh, we assume that k is not an additive character, ep of a n, in the special case, if f is an Eisenstein series. So in the cuspidal case, there's no condition. And in the Eisenstein series case, this is the only exception. So when I write this, you always have to think uh, that the representation associated to it is not the representation associated to that. Or you can think that k is not proportional to one of these, which is a weaker condition. OK, then, so if I do this sum, so we get cancellation. So for every positive epsilon. So I write that the implied constant depends on the test function v. They depend in a completely explicit way. So we can actually play games with v to get some uh, oscillating v's or slightly shorter intervals and lengths p. But I don't write this explicitly. So in terms of k, it depends on the conductor, but polynomially. And the exponent is not terrible, but I don't remember exactly if it's 9 or slightly bigger. Uh, and then with respect to p, we get cancellation. And the cancellation is completely uniform, 1 minus 1 8 plus epsilon for every positive epsilon. Okay. So what is striking, one of the striking things at least, is the complete uniformity of the exponent in the gain. So we always gain 1 8 independently of the complexity of k. By complexity, I mean how complicated it looks when you write it on paper. So to, to say that this is efficient, it means that the c of k, the actual conductor, has to be bounded or growing relatively slowly, so that ck to the power a is less than p to the uh, 1 8, okay? because the trivial bound is roughly p. 
But for instance, if you take any of these examples with fixed polynomials of rational functions f here or there, or here fixed r, then you can apply this theorem for every of one of these, and the exponent gain will be the same. And the fact that this gain is uniform ultimately just comes from the fact that the Riemann hypothesis is just as uniform. So the Riemann hypothesis has code of p independently of which shape of k you take. Okay, so before were known, uh, so of course the subconvex bound was known, and the exponent is the same as the best which is known in that case, uh, is also due, I think, first to Bikowski, and then was generalized. So this is for prime moduli, the exponent is known for subconvex bound, even for general moduli. Um, and also there's this paper of Blomer and Arkush. So it's also known, as I said, for additive characters, for a cuspidal case, EP of AN, that's due to Wilton, this is an old estimate. Uh, and I guess one can interpret various statements in the literature as extremely special cases, maybe with slightly different Karian EP. But apart from that, essentially nothing was known or had been tried. I guess Philip's paper with Venkatesh can be interpreted as giving some of these for a Fourier transform of a multiplicative character. Yeah, I guess which is the same. Okay, so this is the first theorem. Now, as I said, because we can handle the so here also one doesn't see the dependency uh, on t when you take Eisenstein series, but it's under control, it's polynomially bounded. So we can use uh, this estimate for Eisenstein series, interpreting it as special bilinear forms together with extra ingredients coming from the Polyavinogradov method and combinatorial uh, tricks and identities like his browns to uh, handle sums over primes. So again, there exists a positive A such that for all p, for all k, trace function mod p. Again, I assume for simplicity, geometrically reducible with... Uh, so in that case, for sums over primes, we have to exclude a bit more. So it cannot be a multiplicative character times an additive character. Okay, so in that case, it's only clear why we need that for multiplicative characters, because the estimate I'm going to write would be a quasi-Riemann hypothesis if we could handle multiplicative characters. So just like Vinogradov's old uh, ideas involving bilinear forms and so on, this breaks down when uh, the function is multiplicative and chi of n is roughly the only uh, trace function which is actually multiplicative. Okay, and the EP is not so clear, but it also is needed. Uh, then. we can do sums over primes, so sum of lambda of n, k of n, v n over p. And again, we get, uh, so with implied constant depending on epsilon and on v, and on v in a, a well-controlled way, polynomial bound in terms of the discriminant of the conductor. And then we again gain something times 1 minus 1 over 24 plus epsilon. Okay, so again, the exponent gain is completely uniform, uh, independently of what the trace function looks like. It only needs to be a trace function. There's no lambda here. It's, we pass from auto automorphic data through the spectrum, the fact that we have Eisenstein series, which allows us to control uh, divisor sums like that. We can actually put the, the lambda of it. So adding an additional lambda f would be another problem which we don't know how to do.
So there is no dependency at all on <coughs> Ramanujan Peterson type approximations. This is all valid for mass forms and holomorphic forms uniformly. Yes? If you remove, if you replace the smooth wave by like a sharp cutoff, do you get any power saving? Yeah, so we get, we just divide the saving by two. So we get 1 over 16 for, for theorem 1, and for theorem 2, we get 1 over 48. OK, so let me say some uh, highlights of the proof, not, not really even ideas, because it's really quite long altogether. So focusing on where the, the trace functions are used. So there's a lot of analytic number theory involved, but I focus on the trace functions. So on the analytic side, so I begin with theorem 1. On the analytic side, we use amplification. So we view f, so f was of level n, we view it as a cusp form or a modular form uh, of weight p times n, of level p times n, where p is the prime corresponding to the trace function. And we amplify in all the space of forms of level Pn, in forms. So this is an idea that uh, has been used also in particular by uh, these papers of Bikowski and Bomar Koch, and also been used by Ivan Yetz very effectively uh, to amplify certain results. So in some sense here we do, yeah, so it's this idea of putting f of level Pn is, is very natural a posteriori, but a priori uh, one has to think about it. Uh, so that's the analytic step. Then once we amplify, so we use Kuznetsov formula. We could use the Pedersen formula in the holomorphic case, but we would then lose quite a lot in certain estimates. So it's better to use the Kuznetsov formula. Uh, so in particular, so even if you're only interested in the divisor function, so divisor function level one, no special features of its Fourier coefficients, we go to full spectrum of level p including cuspidal spectrum. So, so we treat the divisor function fully as an automorphic uh, object. And in particular, we use cusp forms of level p in order to get, in the end, an estimate uh, for the divisor function, which is sharper than known estimates in, in the case where we apply it. So even for d of n, divisor function. So analytically, this is the feature. So once you do this, so there are many complicated steps, but you end up with, uh, so we are led to certain exponential sums mod p, or generalized exponential sums, which we call correlation sums of k with respect to gamma. So gamma will be an element in PGL2 of fp. And this tries to understand the correlations between uh, not k, but its Fourier transform, and the transform of the Fourier transform when you replace x by gamma x. So k hat of x, k hat of gamma acting on x, conjugate where, so k hat is the Fourier transform, which I recall is the sum over y, uh, k of y, e p of x y over p, uh, sorry, x y. at least when x is in fp. So we, here you could exclude the value, the pole of gamma x if you want, but uh, it actually works out fine if you add it, since this trace function, as I said, extend naturally at infinity. Okay, and then we're going to play uh, a game. So of course, so k was geometrically reducible, that's my assumption. So Fourier transform, as we said last week, is also geometrically reducible. Uh, we make a change of variable, this is also allowed. So k hat of gamma x is also a trace function, and it's also geometrically reducible because the change of variable is bijective and k hat is geometrically reducible. So we are exactly in the situation where we can apply the Riemann hypothesis with k1 is k hat and k2 is k hat of gamma x. And the point is, can we apply the Riemann hypothesis in the sense of are we going to get result A or result B? And what we need, so we need square root cancellation. 
However, not always. This is, if we need this choroid cancellation always, there would be an obvious problem is that you can take gamma equals the identity and then there's no cancellation. So we are not really fortunate, I think it's just a feature of the, this type of method that they, are, uh, they allow for a small number of diagonal cases where you have no cancellation, uh, with few exceptions, which one calls a diagonal exception. Okay. So then uh, what happens is we balance two facts. So which matrices gamma come into the argument? So on the analytic side, we don't get a sum over all matrices in PGL2 of FP. We get a sum over some specific matrices of relatively complicated shape, but which have one feature is that they are not algebraically structured in some sense. They, they do not form a subgroup. So from one, meaning from the analytic argument, the gammas to control are not algebraically structured. I mean, they actually form algebraic families, but not subgroups. At least they do not look like subgroups, and one can check that typically the multiplication will not look like it's uh, stable. However, from the Riemann hypothesis, let's try and understand those gamma for which there's no squared cancellation. So meaning, in which case do we, can, we not apply this, but only that. So if M is a constant large enough depending only on the conductor of K, so that uh, it will control also the conductor of the Fourier transform, because as I said, also last week, the conductor of Fourier transform is controlled in terms of the conductor of K. So if M is large enough, then the only possibility to not get score cancellation with a constant, which is M, is that this condition fails. So this means the opposites here must fail, and so we are in case B. In case B, that means that K1 is proportional to K2. So if uh, gamma satisfies that uh, correlation sum, uh, gamma is larger than M square root of P, then in particular K1 that means k hat is proportional to k hat of gamma x. So there exists some alpha depending on gamma, such that we have that for every x. Yeah, I should say, I actually changed the notation here. So in the paper, what, no, that's the right notation, sorry. So we, we sometimes change notation in our various papers, so we have sometimes to be careful with. So whether this should be associated to k or to k hat is not entirely clear. So here I use the same definition as in the first paper. Okay, anyway, so we have this conclusion. This is a consequence of the Riemann hypothesis. So if m is large enough, so roughly speaking, m must be larger than three times c1 square c2 square, where c1 equals c2 is the conductor of the Fourier transform of k then A fails, so B must be true. And that means in particular that there has to be this correlation. Okay. Now, the point of this is that this shows that the set of bad gammas, so this condition, defines a subgroup of PGL2 of FP. So the set of bad gamma, meaning those for which star fails, is then a subgroup. Okay, that's quite a strong feature. So if you look in analytic number theory at sets of things where some correlation estimates fail, then typically, I mean, you might have intuitively the idea that they would look like something structured, but you would never usually dream to get something that's actually a subgroup. So here we get an actual subgroup. And then what we can do is we can use the classification of subgroups of PGL2 of FP. They are very well understood for a very long time. And using this, we can show then that they do not mess up the outcome of part one. So we get a good estimate 
from part one using this uh, kind of uh, fighting between the non-algebraic structure of the analysis and the algebraic structure of the correlation sums. So we use structure of subgroups of PGL2 of FP, which is almost the same as FL2, SL2 of FP to uh, get uh, a handle on the gammas in one. So meaning that really extremely few of them can possibly create a trouble, so the diagonal cases will be very few, and it's a feature of the situation that very few diagonal cases do not affect the argument. So the nice thing of working, or one nice thing of working in great generality, is that we can have an ID now on what do we need to get beyond the one eight. So the one eight, if you think of the subconvexity case, this is the um, Burgess type exponent which has never been beaten, as far as I know, for subconvex bounds, at least in level aspect. Four prime levels. Four prime levels, yeah. Um, yes. And we can see clearly in this argument where we get, where we would need to have something better. So we would need to understand uh, the variation of the correlation sums as gamma varies, but in the matrices coming from step one. So we would need to get extra cancellation from these uh, families of correlation sums uh, which we can expect to hold, but which sounds extremely difficult to, to get. So for the moment, we haven't really made any progress. It, it has been beaten for quadratic characters. Yeah, but with very different, yeah. Anyway, so that's the that's kind of the highlights of the part of the ideas that come from the Riemann hypothesis in, for CRM1. Uh, so theorem two, so builds on this, uh, meaning on the Eisenstein case of theorem one. So to understand special bilinear forms with smooth coefficients, uh, plus, so on the analytic side, so we need to handle sums of a prime, so we use this brown identity. Uh, which is one of the reasons we can get very uh, uniform estimates because we use it in a quite complicated way. So with many summands, if you remember uh, Terry's lecture, he was taking 10 summands. Uh, so the parameter in the Isborn identity was 10 for the uh, gaps between primes. And here we need to take a, a number of summands that can tend to infinity with the conductor. So it's quite tricky. And so we need that, and we need a bit more on trace functions. So we need more about uh, the subgroup, so the set of bad gammas in some sense. So here where I just said it's obviously a subgroup. Uh, in fact, one can show that it's the FP points of an algebraic subgroup, a linear algebraic subgroup of PGL2, and this turns out to be important in one of the steps here. So algebraic CT. I don't want to go into this. So this comes into the Polyavinogradov method. So when we do kind of general bilinear forms, we are led to uh, special cases where uh, gamma is upper triangular, and we need to be sure that there are not too many bad gammas which are upper triangular, and this turns out to be best handled by proving that it's an algebraic subgroup. Okay, so I don't have a lot of time, so I'll. I'll Mention then a few <coughs> additional applications. But first an example, so kind of a nice example. Uh, so we have a set of bad gamma, so you might ask, well, is this set of bad gamma, does it really exist, or could you just assume that the set of bad gamma is trivial or something? Uh, it can exist and can be quite hidden and not obvious from the definition. So let me give an example that we actually found purely experimentally, which is a posterior kind of, <laughs> I have no idea who we found that, but. Uh, so it's one of the classical examples that has been studied by Katz, uh, is to take a Klusterman sum at n squared, then we take its square minus one. So it's like the symmetric square of the Klusterman sums, but with argument n squared. So if you 
use the standard notation of uh, clue sum and sums S, A, B, P. So this would be S, N, N, P minus P, uh, minus 1 squared. So the fact of taking N, N means that if you just have one factor for the clue sum and sums, it's N squared. Okay? So if you do this, then one shows that uh, for So for this k, if you look at this correlation sum with a factor, uh, with a matrix gamma, this will be of size p. So no correlate, no compensation, meaning it is one of the bad matrices. For all gamma, which are elements in PGL2 of FP, which permute the, uh, 0, infinity, 4, and minus 4. For gamma in the subgroup H, which is a set of gamma in PGL2, such that gamma permutes. So the singular points are 0, infinity, 4, and minus 4. I mean, this is not. Obvious. So these are the singular points of the Fourier transform of this crystal ensemble. So this is not obvious, but follows, for instance, from uh, all the work of Katz and Lomond, which allows you to determine the, Fourier the singularities of Fourier transforms. And this, I guess it's an exercise that can be used if you teach Algebra 1. Uh, so this group is a dihedral group of order 8. So there's something to do with by ratio being uh, of one of the special values. So if you have four points in the pro projective line, so usually there are not so many matrices which permute the four points, except when they have by ratio, which is of special type, and this is one of them. So this is actually not so easy to prove. So because the singular points of the Fourier transform are these four points, it's clear that the bed matrices must be in this subgroup because they have to respect the singular points. But the fact that, conversely, if gamma permutes the four points, then this sum with the Fourier transform of the scale two of n squared squared minus 1 is actually big, is not obvious. So the best proof, so we have two or three proofs, but the best proof is uh, uh, follows from a result of Deligne and Flicker. So we have a computer algebra proof, and David Zewina sent us an automorphic proof. So that's a kind of a nice example. OK, and in the last few minutes, I'll uh, mention some further applications of this, or basically the results in these two theorems. So some of these applications are, are new things. So one is the equidistribution of twisted, some kind of twisted or cycles. So I'll present this quite quickly. So this is the the application actually I use, or we use as motivation uh, in this uh, PISA survey paper that I mentioned in the first talk. So this is what I, I was giving that talk in PISA and I use that as somewhat geometrically accessible even for an audience not of number theorist. So you can find more details by reading the first few pages of this survey. So the idea is really following. So we have the fundamental domain. We are looking at height 1 over p. We're looking at the points w, jp equals j plus i over p, where j is between 0 and p minus 1. So all these points correspond to points in the fundamental domain. Let's call them tau jp in f, so the usual fundamental domain, corresponding points.
And uh, the issue is, are they equally subutant? The answer is yes, like this, this follows from bounds on uh, eigenvalues of echo operators. But what we do is we twist kind of the sampling measure, we twist it with a, a trace function k of n. So uh, what we prove is then, so for any uh, k p with complexity bounded uniformly in p, any f, let's say, continuous with compact support on the fundamental domain, meaning on the modular surface, if you average k of n at this point tau jp, p minus 1, and this is j, um, this is going to go to 0, so with uh, k is not constant, if k is not uh, additive character. Uh, and I should say, so geometrically reducible as usual. So a consequence of this, if you use uh, for k of n example 3, so counting functions of uh, how many times the polynomial eats a given value. So this will say that instead of taking these points uh, omega jp for all j's, you can restrict to the subset where j, let's say, is a quadratic residue or a cubic residue or of the form uh, n square or n cubed plus 2 where n is modulo p, and you will still get this equal distribution. So you cannot force these points to lie, let's say, below uh, the ordinate 2 for most of j by just taking those j which are values of a polynomial. This is the type of thing that it means. So it's geometrically quite nice. Um, and it can have applications. So in the, in the paper of Michel and Venkatesh on subconvexity, they explain that in some cases, this is also equivalent to subconvexity for twisted L functions. So that's example one of application. So interestingly, to, apply, to prove this theorem, we apply theorem 1 for the Fourier transform of k. Which means that, in fact, if you want just to prove this theorem, you don't need to know the existence of the Fourier transform and trace functions, because you end up taking twice the Fourier transform, which gives you back your original thing. So that's one application. Uh, so theorem 2 has some applications which we haven't quite written down in detail to low-lying zeros. I won't give any more information of that, of certain L functions. So symmetric square L functions essentially in level aspect. This is because when you apply the explicit formula, you have sums over primes of closed sum and sums with prime arguments, which is, uh, okay, I raised it. It's the type of sum that we handle in uh, example 2 in theorem 2. Uh, so what we also did is D3 in arithmetic progressions, which, is, which was used, at least some of the ideas in the Polymath 8 paper. So here the point was we have a much more streamlined proof of the theorem of Friedlander and Ivanietz on uh, getting exponential distribution larger than one half for D3 in arithmetic progressions. Uh, with a much better exponent than even East Browns, which had improved Friedlander Ivanietz. Uh, in fact, we don't even need the Friedlander Ivanietz sum. So it's all incorporated in the statement. In general statements, we can just almost uh, use just generic properties of trace functions again. So it's streamlined and stronger compared with Friedlander Ivanietz and East Brown. But it's only for prime moduli. So So it would be a bit more complicated to do for the general moduli. Uh, example four. So if you're really nasty, you would say, well, you're just either proving non-interesting new results or improving known good results. So let's prove something that's not known. Uh, so this is something which is still work in progress with Blomer and Milicevic. So 
uh, we can handle with power saving a twisted moment of quadratic, I mean, not quadratic, Dirichlet character L values at one half. So there's a conjugate squared times twisted L function with a fixed modular form, uh, cusp form. Uh, with power saving. So why is that interesting? So, well, if you replace the cusp form by a Zeilenstein series, you're going to get modulus of L chi 1 half 4, which, is a, uh, which was done then by Matt Young a few years ago. Uh, and on the other hand, so we can handle this and we are on the way, or at least we have some, we reduce the case where you would have L F chi uh, modulus square, so without this first part, but just a pure cusp form. Second moment, which is a well-known open problem with power saving, uh, we reduce that to estimates for trace function, which we hope one day to, uh, to obtain. Uh, and again, even in the Matt Young case, our proof is much more streamlined, exponent is much better. So altogether, we have some quite nice applications, I think, of, uh, of this. Okay, so I'll stop for today. Uh, questions? Comments? Is it hard if the trace functions are not geometrically reducible? No, I mean, I just put it in. So in the proof, it's useful because you see we, these correlation sums are not linear. So, but in fact, the estimates, the final estimates are linear. So you would just decompose and apply it to every component.